Welcome to the Animation Industry Podcast. My name is Terry, and um, today when I was walking my dog down the street, I was wondering if strangers look at this super tall man, I'm like 6'4", with a super tiny dog, he's like nine pounds, and know that I'm just m making silly stop motion videos in my bedroom for money. <laughs> This chat is with Mac Whiting, who is the supervising animation director at Warner Brothers Animation. Over his career, he's worked on projects like Harley Quinn, the SpongeBob movie, Teen Titans Go vs. Teen Titans, and most recently, the Guardians of the Galaxy Holiday Special. In our chat, he shares his journey from pursuing a fine arts degree to getting his first job as a storyboard revisionist and working his way up to director. So without further ado, let's jump in. Hi, Mac. How is it going? It's going well. Thank you. Nice to be Great. here, Terry. Perfect. Um, I was reading your website before this, and it says that you got the opportunity to paint Dolly Parton for <laughs> her album cover. Is that true? I did. That is How true did that story. happen? Please tell me. Um, that's just one of those wild, wacky things about living and working in Hollywood many years ago. Um, there's an incredible artist by the name of Kai Ahrens, who does a lot of posters. Um, he works with the Hollywood Bowl a lot of times and does promotional posters for different artists that come there. And um, just in the circles of Hollywood and doing different artistic projects and things in one way or another, we were connected through mutual friends and um, he needed a painter. He has a relationship with Dolly Parton and he needed an artist who could who could paint her for her forthcoming album cover. And so I got commissioned to do it. So it was a, a real thrill. Was that anxiety? Like I got asked to paint my a family member's dog this Christmas and I like freaked out because I was like, this I need to make this look good. Like <laughs> oh yeah, of course. Um yeah, I freaked out a little bit at first and then it was like, okay, this is no big deal, right? You know, just just another painting. Um, tried to compose myself and um, it was a lot of fun. I mean, it, Kai was great with his feedback and, and was very supportive. Uh, most importantly, of course, you want to represent Dolly and make her feel good about how she looks and who she is and all those things. Um, but it was incredible. So I, I try to kind of capture a little bit of the vintage Dolly, but also make it contemporary. Um, and then, yeah, apparently she loved it because she used it as the album cover. And then I saw as she went on tour, it was also on other promotional materials and things like that. So it was pretty neat. Wow, that's that's really cool and random. And yeah, super uh, random. Really living the Hollywood <laughs> dream, kind of. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Um, okay, so maybe let's roll it back before we get into kind of the latest project you worked on. Um, you have a fine arts degree, which uh, means you're an amazing painter, which is why you got the opportunity to paint Dolly. Uh, but you graduated with a fine arts degree and then immediately started uh, pencil and paper animating and storyboarding. Uh, <laughs> how did that happen? <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great uh, question. So um, growing up, I was always interested in art. Um, my grandmother was actually a big influence on me. She was an artist. Uh, she just did it recreationally and was a really talented painter and drawer. And my mom is also an interior designer. So there's some artistic influence there as well. Um, but yeah, coming out of high school, I had an amazing teacher and she was the one that encouraged me and kind of opened my eyes to the fact that you could study fine art. I, you know, that was not something that was on my radar. Um, my dad is an attorney. I was always thinking of, uh, you know, pursuing something a little more practical uh, career wise, but then um, kind of looking into it and applying myself, I found this, these incredible um, fine arts opportunities around the country and ended up coming down to Southern California. I was born and raised in the Bay Area um, to USC, which had an incredible art department. Um, also a great cinematic, you know, arts program as well, of course, very well known for that. And so it was cool. I was exposed to a lot of different types of art, um, things that people were doing. And at the time was kind of envisioning or trying to become an illustrator. Mm -hmm. um, so I worked in sports illustration for many years. Um, I collaborated with a few different professional baseball teams and was actually pursuing a licensing deal with Major League Baseball. I had always had this kind of childhood dream 
to um, produce and publish my own uh, trading cards. I, I loved um, the Donruss Diamond King baseball cards growing up. And so I had this childhood aspiration to become like the next great painter of, of baseball cards, um, which was really fun, but not necessarily like a lifelong career choice. So uh, the practical side of my brain and also my, my family, my, my, dad, my dad was saying, hey, maybe you wanna, you know, this is great, but think about other opportunities that may come along. And so when I was graduating in 2000, um, I, I just was berating my, my counselor there at campus about job opportunities, something that involved art and um, the artistic industry on a whole. And so I did some mural painting, I did different things, but nothing was really resonating as like a career path. And then an internship at Nickelodeon came up as an opportunity. Um, it was just an entry level position. And I had this sort of eureka moment of like, of course, you know, I loved comic books. I loved cartoons as a kid, um, but honestly did not, was not really exposed to, again, that being a career opportunity. Like I kind of just literally fell and stumbled into this, um, this opportunity in this world. And so I went to Nickelodeon and um, wait hold, hold up like the yeah. Nickelodeon internships are like super super sought after people from <laughs> all around North America sure. slash wherever apply like yeah it's really tough to get in uh -huh. back in 2000 was it the same same situation I can't speak to um their hiring practices I mean clearly there was I, I went in for an in-person interview yeah. And I had um I had a you know professional portfolio at that time. It was not animation related, but um I give a lot of credit to the the person who interviewed me, uh ironically, is uh has now gone on to become the head of Cartoon Network, who is Kelly Cruz. Oh. She at the time was a was a um higher end producer at Nickelodeon. And um, she, I don't know, we had a great rapport in this interview. She s clearly saw some sort of, um, you know. He's like, here are all these potential students coming with uh, storyboard portfolios. And then we got this, <laughs> we got this painter. He's got a outside the box. Cards. <laughs> yeah, outside the box painter um, yeah. who did printmaking and, and all these different things. But she saw some potential in me. Um, and I told her, you know, I was willing to do anything. I, I, I didn't care. I just wanted to get in there and learn what I could about animation. Nice. And so they hired me. Um, at first, it was an unpaid internship. And I did all the things that interns would do. I would make Xerox copies and get people coffee and do whatever they asked me to do. I was just happy to be in the building. Um, and quickly, I, I kind of befriended some of the storyboard artists and other people around my little cubicle area. Yeah. And... Um, I was also deliberately using any and every break I got to draw and sketch and would um, not so subtly leave these drawings around my space so that eventually, um, after a few months of doing this, you know, they said, hey, we couldn't help you or notice your drawings. And wow, those are pretty good. And, you know, what is it necessarily you want to do in animation? And, yeah. uh, you know, I was always very candid about it. And, and I think part of it may have, I don't want to speak for them, but it may have been refreshing that I, I really was so just like green and just bright eyed and doughy and excited to absorb whatever information I could that mm -hmm. um, they, re they really were so kind. They took me kind of under their wing and started me um, at a very entry level position of doing storyboard revisions on a preschool show um, called Oswald the Octopus, which was uh, an adorable show. Um, starring Fred Savage as the voice of Oswald. And it was just like the perfect entry point into animation for me because I got to understand the storytelling aspect from the storyboard. Um, I got to actually draw, you know, do practical drawing and application of these are final boards that are being drawn on paper and work with some really talented storyboard artists who were able to kind of you know, give me the tutelage and, and guidance in terms of how this all works. So amazing. That was that was my first gig. Yeah. I haven't heard the word tutelage in quite a while. I'm, yeah, I'm like, kind of an old old school, <laughs> old school guy here. 
Uh, your story, you know, so far, it sounds like the classic, like got the unpaid internship, worked really hard, ran the coffees, drew every moment you could, got notice, et cetera. You know, uh, especially in like today's climate, it's really tough to take something that's unpaid. Were you living at home at the time? Were you supporting yourself in other other ways? Um, so I had I had moderate success as an illustrator, um, enough to pay the bills. Um, and I also had a lot of help from friends from college. I was living with a friend from college. His parents um, were in real estate, so they had a rental home that was unoccupied. So my rent was very cheap. Oh, nice. Um, now, one of the caveats of that was we lived down by LAX. And for those who don't know, um, Nickelodeon Studios is in Burbank. So that was a good two-hour commute um, yeah. on, on a daily basis going each way off the 405. Um, but again, this was all part of, in, retro, in retrospect, I look back and it's, it's like, I can't believe I did any of this, but um, I didn't care. I mean, I would have driven four hours to have worked at Nickelodeon. Wow. You know, that was sort wow. of my mentality was um, once I kind of, it was almost an immediate realization that like, oh my gosh, yes, this is such a natural merging of all of my interests and something that I had maybe been building towards subconsciously my whole life. So once I kind of landed in there and felt the energy of the artistry, the collaborative environment and the storytelling aspect, it just kind of clicked like this. I knew kind of I had found my place and, and was like, I'll do whatever it takes to, to keep this train wow. rolling. I mean, that, I was literally just going to ask you, because it sounds like you were doing a lot of different uh, kind of not random, but like different paths before you found this. Once you realize, you know, so young at Nickelodeon doing kind of revisions and whatnot, once you kind of realized this was for you, did it get easier mentally to streamline yourself or was it was it now extra hard because you knew what you wanted to do and you had to work at it? Because, you know, you've you, you have quite an illustrious career You're coming <laughs> up almost 25 years in animation, like and Oof. here you are doing some really, really cool things th these days. So, yeah, how um, how does the journey feel once you realize this? It's for you. <laughs> um, no, that's a great question. So uh, before getting into uh, it's and I I'm man, it's startling to hear 25 years. I don't feel that old, but I know that I am <laughs> getting that old. Um, but no, hey, that's so, a good thing, right? If you don't feel that yeah, old, that's great. Yeah, sure. Um, but one of the most important learning lessons, actually, you know, I'm kind of talking about the silver linings of that experience, but one of the most important lessons I learned about the industry and myself in that moment was, you know, I, once I got that, the paid job and I was doing the board revisions and I was on the crew and everything, I thought, oh, I got it made, you know, my, this is it. I'm going to be doing this forever. Here we go. And the stark realization, it was at, at the end of that season, um, there was no guarantee the show was getting picked up. In fact, it didn't get picked up. And so I, I had sort of an exit interview with the producer at the end of the show and I said, your work was great, Mac. It was such a pleasure having you. You know, if there's a season two, we'd really love you to come back and actually try you at prop design. And I was like, oh my gosh, that sounds like a, an upgrade, you know? I was like, absolutely. And I said, but I'm sorry, what do you mean if? And they go, oh yeah, well, our season's done. Like we're on hiatus. So um, there's a job posting in the lobby, you know, there's, there's needs on other shows, but essentially your work here is done. And I was like, oh, my God, I, I had no idea how any of this worked. So I literally was learning on the job. And so um, the harsh realization is even in today's climate, you know, these um, these opportunities aren't just uh, sort of in perpetuity. Like you really do have to hustle and find the next thing. Um, and so I, I I looked around and, and fortunately, there was a friend who I had made at the studio at the time and I was asking her what are you know what are you doing and she said oh I got wind of this digital company that's starting up and they're doing flash animation and they have an online show and they might be making a movie and this and that and I said yeah yeah where is that you know I want in on that um so it's a funny story I won't I, I don't want to get too much into the weeds on that but there was a studio at the time that was doing webisodes that were very popular amongst 
college kids and they were ramping up to do a movie in flash i had and i i didn't even know what flash was it's like i kind of loosely knew of course the the things that were being played on the internet used a flash player but i'm like how is that applicable to animation and so i went she got me an interview at this company and uh they looked at my portfolio and again they're like okay have you ever used the flash program to do animation i said no and so they said okay we'll hire you on uh you know a two week we'll get sign you a two week contract to see if you can kind of pick up the 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 production process and the program and we'll go from there and i ended up working on that movie for over two years i never signed another contract that's a <laughs> that's a learning experience for you young kids make sure you double check or renegotiate your contract um but anyway uh yeah so i ended up learning digital animation again in the trenches on the fly um, and was very blessed to be um, alongside some really talented and really cool people that helped kind of guide me along that path. Um, so there was this very immediate and short, like within two years, I had gone from not working in animation to then learning paper, you know, animation to now digital paperless animation. So it was just a crash course of, yeah. um, of how to do this stuff. And admittedly, the, my work was probably pretty terrible, um, but I got tangible, real on the job experience, which was uh, ultimately in retrospect, the most valuable part of the whole experience was, um, and it was also a very small uh, company and small production. So you really had to create things for yourself. There weren't departments per se, you know, it wasn't like, oh, we'll just send that over to the the background department or the props but it's like you know if you need something you just make it so um that was pretty wild i mean it sounds like you were really down for anything and because like have you reached a point in your career where you're like i'm not gonna learn this like for me like 3d i've tried so many times i'm not it's not my thing and if a project came up that was in 3d i'd be like ah sorry i'm gonna i'm i'm not gonna throw myself at that do you do you ever have you reached kind of that in your career now that you've well established kind of what you do um i wouldn't say that i i kind of i have to admit i still have i have the opposite mentality like i'm willing to try to learn anything if, it, if mm. i feel like it's going to benefit the program or, or the sorry the process yeah. Um, I'm willing to dive in there and try to understand it. 3D, admittedly, is one I have not delved into because I understand how much of a time commitment it is. So I would have remained in the 2D space um, primarily. Um, but, you know, Toon Boom Harmony has the ability to incorporate 3D elements into it. And so there have been some occasions where other artists have um, have sort of uploaded or, or imported 3D elements and I've kind of played with the, around with those. And I, I mean, it looks incredible. Like the capacity, the things you're capable of doing are awesome. Yeah. Um, so I would never rule it out, but it's also to your point, having the decades of experience doing a certain medium, it's hard to necessarily say, okay, tomorrow I'm just gonna drop everything and commit two months of my life to learning 3D. Like that's not a, practical um thing at, for me at the moment but uh i also you know i also have kids and a wife and try to have some sort of a, of a life outside of work right. um, so maintaining that work-life balance you know maybe 10 or 15 years ago if someone said hey you gotta learn 3d you're not gonna last in this industry i would just dove in head first but um but yeah it is it's nice that at least 2d animation still has a place in the industry you know yeah for sure so for now it's not an issue although with ai coming along you never know <laughs> yeah i mean that's that's a whole other topic we could talk about i just ha kind of have one more follow-up question from you know the story the story you shared um how you know it's quite frequent that you know when your project ends you have to look for work but how mm -hmm. do you approach it from like you know i'm looking for work uh not in a desperate way but uh in a way that you know you're asking everybody and you're looking for opportunities and i i'm trying to yeah. figure out how i'm trying to word this but like how do you ask for work in a way that doesn't feel desperate while also kind sure. of giving yourself confidence and an, and an ego boost i guess yeah um 
I think that a huge, I mean, it's become easier in a sense only in, in the way that the, the internet is so prevalent and job postings, these sites and, and the industry on a whole, I think it has a much stronger support system than it did back then. I mean, back then it was literally kind of who you knew and just trying to make connections and stuff. I think retain, you know, retaining personal relationships is still a huge part of it. Um, I would advise young artists when you get onto a job, you know, take note of sort of who's in charge or who your contacts are. Keep a contact list of people, um, especially if it's a positive experience. It never hurts to just reach out to someone and say, hey, I really enjoyed working with you. Don't know if you have any other future opportunities, Don't, you know, or just say, hey, I'm just curious what you're up to, because I think you're a great artist. Um, it's it's incredible how often in our industry stuff is just kind of like, oh, we need we need a background artist. Oh, you know what? I worked with someone on such and such and they were really good. And then next thing you know, you're connecting with with someone new. And um, as much as the pandemic has sort of reopened the understanding that this is a global art form and there are studios literally all over around the world and, and people doing this um, all over, it's still kind of a, a small pond in the grand scheme of things. You know, it really is kind of, you can create relationships and uh, connections that, that in many ways can sustain, you know, what you're doing for a long time. Um, have, have all of your projects, I guess, been based on who you know, or have you ever reached out kind of cold to somebody you wanted to work with or wanted to work at or something like that? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I wouldn't say they're all based on who I know per se, but it's, I think it's more a cumulative effect of, um, I mean, the more I, the older I get, the more I look back and uh, this is going to sound really cheesy, but I kind of, I do kind of believe also in like the power of manifestation or, or at the very least, like putting a plan in place or, or setting your sights on something that you want to do. I mean, for example, um, for years, I, I really loved, I mean, going way back, I loved, you know, Looney Tunes cartoons and all that kind of stuff growing up. I had no idea who was produce, producing that stuff. I mean, I knew Bugs Bunny was Warner Brothers, but um, even as a as a 20-year-old out of college, when, when I start, was still watching animated content more regularly, I loved what Warner Brothers was doing with their direct TV, uh, direct to, their, they call them DTVs, but direct-to-video movies and stuff especially with the superhero genre. And of course, um, the Batman, the animated series with Bruce Tim was a huge inspiration. And I just remember watching those shows. And then as I got older, I would look at the credits and be like, who's that person? Man, I, I, I need to get to know that person. I want to work with that person. And I just kept thinking it and talking about it. And then I would look them up and I would kind of try to understand their career path and those kinds of things. Um, so ultimately, long story short, like now being at Warner Brothers and getting to work with and talk to Bruce Tim yeah. or, you know, work under Sam Register, the president of animation at Warner Brothers, who whose name is on every single one of these projects that that gets put out. Um, it's sort of like this this culmination of a dream where it's like I literally talked about it. I thought about it. I kind of focused my energies towards it. And whether consciously or subconsciously was slowly working towards that goal. Um, so I don't think there's ever, I mean, this sounds really cheesy, but it's like, you you know, if you have a dream or aspiration to work with someone, there's no reason why you can't. I mean, the worst, worst, worst thing that could happen is someone say, no, thank you. Right. But that's also something in this industry. Um, it's not always an absolute rejection, but I, there are countless number of projects I've worked on that have never seen the light of day. So at the time they feel like a knife through the heart, right? Like, Oh my God, I spent a year on this and no one's ever going to see it. But now looking back, it's like, what can you take away from that project? What did you learn on that project? Who are the people you met? Was the working environment positive? Were there other artists you learned from? Were there connections you made? Like, there's always something to be taken away from that stuff. So younger artists, definitely, I just encourage them to 
it, it, reach out if you can find someone's contact information. I mean, I'm on uh, LinkedIn and all that stuff and you have questions like just send someone an email. You never know. I mean, the worst thing is you don't hear from them or they say, sorry, we're busy. We don't have any room right now. So oh, what? Yeah. I mean, you know, that doesn't, is that going to stop you from being a creator because someone said, no, thank you. Like you just yeah. got to put yourself out there. Totally. And I mean, like from somebody looking at your career path, you know, there's a lot of hard work and dedication and, you know, grinding as well that gets there. And who knows, maybe you didn't end up at Warner Brothers, you would have ended up at somewhere else and been just as happy. It's kind of following the path of opportunity and seeing where it takes you as well. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I really like this idea of manifestation. I, I 100% can think of times in my life that it's happened as well. Um, which, you know, is <laughs> I made the I made the change to get into animation very recently in my life. And I already can think of a couple of things like I'm working on something right now that a couple of years ago, I, I said to myself, I really want to work with these people. And then out of the blue, now I'm working with them because they reached out to me and asked me. So that's just random. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I do appreciate you, you something you said just now, too. Like the other part of it is um, is the work. You know, there's also I mean especially pre-family and kids, uh, this is a job um, and a career that you really do have to love because it is a ton of work. Like, I don't think people outside don't necessarily really appreciate and understand how much work animation is. I mean, there were countless uh, months, years of my life where you're just working till two, three in the morning every night for, for weeks on end because that's what it took to make something look to the standard that we held for ourselves you know and there was also this mentality of like we got to treat this like it's our last job because quite frankly it might be you just never know so there's a level of pride and artistry and also just a grind factor like um but again in retrospect i think all of that it was we were kind of like forged through the fire of just being in the trenches and just having to get it done so now it still happens, um, but it's more kind of on my terms instead of sort of the project dictating that or the studio dictating that. It's more like, I can't let this go because it needs to be really good. And <laughs> I get to kind of decide that as opposed to someone else being like, this has got to be, you know, it's due tomorrow. Just get it done. Uh, as somebody who's been staying up at till 1 a.m. every day for the past two weeks working there on you go. a side project, I yeah. totally understand it. It's there a blessing go. and a curse because like if you're for me, if like I'm putting something out into the public eye that I, I know that I've worked on, I can't I can't not make it something to the standard that I want it to be, I guess. It's just like yeah. I, I don't want to put out something really crappy and I want to make something that I feel good about and i hope that other people can look at and be like oh that was all right <laughs> yeah so. no it's so true i i am with you there 100 percent. um so let's talk about one of your latest projects actually which is a, 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 a side hustle I, <laughs> I guess on top of your regular work how, tell me how you what conversation sparked you working on the guardians of the galaxy holiday special besides your day job at warner brothers yeah so um kind of encapsulating all the things we just talked about. Um, I was, I had the pleasure of working with Tony Cervoni a few years ago at Warner Brothers, uh, who's an incredibly talented producer, director, animator in his own right. Um, for those who don't know, Tony directed the Scoob movie. He's done years and years of work at Warner Brothers on various classic IPs like Tom and Jerry and a bunch of other things. Um, but we actually collaborated on a short that was being done for the um, for Warner Brothers for a uh, show called Legends of Tomorrow, DC Legends of Tomorrow. And there was a particular episode in which the characters were transported into a Disney-like environment um, through this magical process and so on and so forth. So Tony was producing it and he came to our team at Warner. Um, we have a small internal animation team. Uh, to produce it. And so it was super fun. Tony was incredible to work with. Amazing guy. Um, again, really inspiring the person I had heard and read a lot about and then got to work with firsthand. Um, so he um, was actually someone who Stupid Buddy had worked out to. They, they He has a relationship with some of the people at the studio. And they 
reached out to Tony and said, do you know anyone that might be a good fit for this project? And so he was kind enough to recommend me for the job, um, which was very cool. Um, and so at that time, I was introduced to the team, uh, Matt Senreich and Seth Green, the, the co-founders of the studio and the production head at the time. And they kind of explained it to me um, in broad strokes. And initially, the discussion was just about producing the test. Um, and so I heard rotoscope animation, Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special. And I said, I'm in, you know, yeah. so sign me up. Um, so the initial test was. So, sorry, Stupid Buddy yeah. had already uh, received the project or they were pitching to get it. And this was a test for the pitch. Right. To my to my knowledge, it was still in the pitch phase. Um, oh, wow. So so Seth, and, uh, Seth Green and James Gunn have a long friendship and relationship. And I think I think Disney and Marvel and James himself were kind of, you know, looking under each and every rock to see kind of who could bring a unique perspective to it. Um, so again, my understanding is that there was a discussion that took place and and they both kind of landed on the the possibility of doing it rotoscope style to tie into this nostalgic classic look that that James Gunn um yeah you know commonly includes into his themes of of nostalgia and things that we grew up with and are identifiable um so yeah so so that they, they were still reviewing pitches at this time they had not actually secured the formal job um and so you know the Ralph Bakshi was thrown out there as an influence um obviously Ralph Bakshi produced a lot of rotoscope films starting back in the 70s and 80s. Um, growing up, I loved the Lord of the Rings movie. That was a huge influence in my life as well. Um, and then later on, Fire and Ice and some of those things were incredible. And so I said, okay, yeah, yeah, let's, this sounds amazing. I want to, I want to give it a go. Um, and then I just, as an individual, you know, artist talked to the team and said, well, I think that realistically, the only way to do this and capture what we're looking for is just to, to do this traditionally and just hand draw, you know, every frame and, and really lean into this, um, this process. And there's some great like YouTube videos out there on the making of fire and ice and stuff. And, um, so I was watching those for inspiration and, uh, just watching Bakshi films in general. So wait, wait. Uh, um, yeah. Okay. So <laughs> this is already after that you're confirmed to work on. Like, what did you say or do besides having a recommendation that they trusted you to be like, yeah, he's going to head this up, uh, even though we're still in the pitching phase. Yeah, they have a relationship, yeah. but it could go to sure. somebody else. So they're they're like, we're going to trust, we're going to trust this guy that we got a recommendation for yeah. to land us this job and create something really cool. Like, yeah. So I, I, well, I immediately, I mean, I, I, I think they were, Tony, Tony's voice carried a lot of weight. So they were, yeah. and they looked me up, of course, and saw that I had the stuff I had worked on. And he's um, got credits on IMDb. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's, he's a real person who's made. He painted Dolly Parton. All right. Before. Good. good. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, I mean, we, we spoke via Zoom and I think we aligned creatively and had a good rapport and even as we were kind of negotiating the terms of the deal and stuff like that, I mean, I just started designing the characters. I just took it upon myself to just jump right in. I mean, I'm like, even if the stuff doesn't get used, it's going to be a fun exercise for me. So something they had mentioned doing was um, for the test was a, and this was a test not only for me, you know, for them, but also like their test for Marvel. Marvel's reviewing other submissions. So they're still trying to determine which way they want to go with it too. Um, so I just started drawing Yondu. Um, we kind of discussed doing like a single shot of Yondu doing some dialogue. So I just started pulling reference materials. I went on the internet. I did a deep Google search. I started watching the Disney What If series. Um, I rewatched the Guardians movies. I mean, I was just trying to sort of absorb and encapsulate as much of the information as I, as I could to kind of inform my creative choices on it. Um, and then I also reached out to a friend named Rafael Hurtado, who's an incredible background designer and um, 
one of my go-to guys and said, Hey, I don't, you know, just to check on his availability, like, could you can maybe come up? I just need a singular background for this, you know, I'll pay you out of my own pocket or whatever. Um, and then once they saw his work, they're like, no, 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 we'll, we'll cover the bill. But anyway, I, I just started making moves basically. Yeah, I, I just sort of yeah. pr proceeded as if like, we're going to make this, I'm going to do Yeah. This. It's almost like just, to, just continue as if you already have the job. And honestly, if I was hiring you, I'd be like, oh yeah, easy, easy done. This guy's already thinking about it. He's already right. doing the work. He's, he's putting in the time, like hundred <laughs> percent. Well, I appreciate that. So, so yeah, so those initial designs and things and, and my, my sort of creative input was aligning with theirs. And so we, we just, kind of, they said, okay, let's do it. And so the initial test was an eight. Um, at that point we reached out to Marvel and said, Hey, to really do this effectively, we would like some actual footage that we can use, you know, that's approved by you guys. And so they provided us with a short um, dialogue scene of Yondu from, it, it was actually a, an outtake from the original Guardians movie, which was great. Um, and I just started animating it straight ahead. And I think it was like an eight second shot. It came out to something like over 200 frames. Um, You're just on Toon Boom every night. Just on Toon Boom on twos. And I was, I just started drawing and um, it was really helpful. It was a helpful process for the bigger picture. But in the meantime, I was just grinding. I mean, I'm like, this is, this is crazy, but this is a labor of love. I mean, this is what it, this is what we do, you know? Um, and I felt really good about it. I thought it was looking really good. And um, and it was capturing the vibes that I was hoping it would. You know, it felt like uh, a Bakshi kind of animated thing. And I put a little bit of filtering on it and stuff just to age it up a, t a tinge. And then Raphael came through with this amazing background. And that took me a little over a month to make, wow. which is insane. Yeah. Um, and again, it, this, and this is, is this is like in your after hours, like you this come is after hours. Work. This, this, these are from the hours of like your kids are like, dad, can till, we, till can we eat dinner? And you're like, <laughs> go <laughs> I'd, I'd, at some hot wait, dogs. I'd at least wait till the kids would go to bed. And then, um, my wife, God bless her, was very supportive and understanding, at least in the beginning stages as, as what a spouse would be. And then I'm of like, course. babe, you know, I, I'm, I'm unavailable for the next four weeks every night until the wee hours of the morning. And there were some nights where I just would stay up all night. And so just... so why did you why did you yeah. want to take this project in the first place if you knew it would, <laughs> um, you know, basically take up all of your spare time and you away from kind of your family and, and stuff? Like, I I, I I would do the same thing. <laughs> I know why, yeah. I, just for yeah. the love of it and et cetera. Yeah. But why would you, after, you know, you've established yourself as a supervising animation director at uh, Warner Brothers, uh, for quite a while now and why would you take something on with a completely different studio freelance it's not going to last very long um because uh, i'm a crazy person i don't know right no, that's i mean that's all the answer I, you need yeah i i mean i the truth be told i love this stuff i love what i do and every now and again something will come along and just light that fire of inspiration totally, and yeah. um you know there i love everything i work on i love getting a chance to animate and do stuff every day. But there's an occasional project that comes up where you're like, oh my God, this is the one that I'll just, I'm ready and willing to pour all of my energy into. I mean, considering the the high profile nature of it, who's involved, the, the content, I mean, I'm a fan of the content to begin with. And so getting to work with these characters and, and that studio and all these different things, it was like, yeah, I, I'm in. Um, so yeah, I just, it was just a labor, you know, that phrase labor of love gets thrown around a lot. I mean, this was truly and genuinely a labor of love. Yeah. Um, and so long story short, uh, the test submitted the test, stupid buddy was thrilled with it. We sent it to Marvel. Um, and shortly thereafter, they're like, yeah, this is the one. Um, and the feedback we got which really meant a lot to me was they said that it was the one that most authentically represented sort of the Bakshi rotoscope style that they were aspiring towards that a lot of other studios did beautiful work, but they kind of reverted to the, their traditional animation pipeline. Right. Which yeah. is, which was the thing that 
I picked up on in the sort of brief description and initial conversations that we had was that the Bakshi thing was more important in a sense, you know, capturing that rotoscope nostalgic style. So, yeah, so then we get the, you know, Stupid Buddy was officially awarded the job, at which time they reached out and asked if I would be willing to then take it on as a supervising director. And I was like, well, yeah, we've come this far. There's no turning back now, of course. Um, and then the next, the ensuing state steps were were just insanity. Um, <laughs> you know, we we conveyed to them and they fully endorsed and understood, like, the only way to do this thing and maintain that sort of level of authenticity is to shoot it live action. Um, and so there was some back and forth about whether we were going to organize and, and produce that and hire actors and stuff, or if they were going to take it on. And that sort of permeated for a little bit before the next thing we know, they're saying, okay, James Gunn is going to direct this. Um, on an off day in Georgia in a wow. sound stage while they're shooting guardians three, he has, you know, the crew there. And so <laughs> they flew Matt Senreich, Seth Green and myself to Georgia to go supervise and participate in this shoot, which is insanity. Yeah. That sounds amazing. Yeah. <laughs> it was, it's as, as, as amazing as it sounds. Um, so I, again, hearing that, I started doing some boards and stuff. Yeah. And um, I hope somebody from those other studios that didn't get this the test are listening to this and realizing what <laughs> they missed out on. <laughs> oh, no, that's horrible. I don't know. I don't begrudge any. I, I'm sure I'm sure there was some amazing work in there. I would love to see the other tests if I ever yeah. could. That would be yeah. unbelievable. Um, but yeah, so I just, at that point, I was just like full bore. I just started doing more designs um, of the other characters and trying to, you know, that was a big part of it too, is designing these characters. I had a bunch of live action reference, but you're also trying to now design them in a way that you can redraw them over thousands of frames. So including enough information where it's still interesting and detailed enough that represents the characters and gives that live action feel, but not so detailed that you're killing yourself with all these micro yes. dots and stuff. So that was an interesting process. Did you, did you had a team at this point to help animate? No, it was just you. You drew every thousand frames? No, 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 no. I'm sorry. Not at, not, not at that point. At that point, um, you know, once we did the shoot, we had, we clearly acknowledged, we're like, okay, I'm on board, but we're going to have to find a vendor to animate the majority of this. I still ended up animating some of the shots myself. But for the for the full piece, we partnered with Studio Moshi, who's mm. a really talented studio out of Australia. Um, and they had a, an amazing animation director in their own right, who was sort of my conduit for their for their studio, a guy by the name of Christian Clay. And um, and so off we went. But um, going back to the shoot, so the shoot was unbelievable. We were there with James Gunn. Um, Michael Rooker was there playing Yondu in, in full costume, n minus the, the face makeup and the, the head piece and all that stuff. Um, Sean Gunn, James's brother was there representing Craglin. And then they hired a younger actor to play young Peter. Um, so that was another interesting thing was this, of course, is being, uh, the piece itself is a flashback sequence so um sean gunn's character we had to design as sort of an, a teenage craglin and so while we used his performance for the basis of our rotoscoping we then had to go in and kind of redraw him um as a younger version of himself which right. was kind of interesting um and similarly the young actor who stood in for young peter uh james expressed that he really wanted young peter to look like the original actor from the films who played young Peter. So we used the stand-in actor's performance, but then applied sort of our interpretation of the original actor um, to his performance. So wow, that was only making our jobs more complicated, but was still a fun kind of exercise, creative exercise and problem solving. 
Yeah, it sounds like you added a whole new set of I, one of my questions before was like, how how often do you have to jump in and learn something completely new? And so it sounds like even <laughs> just recently you had to do yeah. this again. Yeah, for sure. Which is amazing. But it sounds it sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, it was a ton of fun. Even even just sitting drawing frames every night, you know, I'm just uh, for myself, I would just like plug in music and go at it. It's it's kind of yeah uh cathartic is that the right word yeah so absolutely kind of go yeah. into that and, and yeah. get lost in that for a while so absolutely and that's yeah. the thing too um you know as i've grown in my role and in, in my career and stuff um i still get in there and i still draw and animate quite a bit but a lot of what i do is more coordinating things or producing things so you know i i get and do board revisions occasionally still direct things and board them myself but a lot of times it's just I'm surrounded by an incredible team of artists and animators now. And it's it's more trying to allocate my knowledge and spread it over three or four projects at a time. Um, yeah. So that doesn't always enable me to do stuff firsthand. So this was one of those rare ops where I'm like, oh, I'm going to get get to go in there and get my hands dirty, you know. Nice. And that was sort of a, another incentive for me to, to get involved. Kind of bringing you back to what got you into the industry in the first place. I'm wondering, yeah. you just said, you know, kind of spreading your knowledge and figuring it out for what you're currently doing. What would be your biggest, you know, asset that you have as, as the supervising director at Warner's, at Warner Brothers that, um, you know, makes you what you are? Um. Well, it's kind of embarrassing talking about myself, but, uh, <laughs> I, no, you know, um, no, I, in all honesty, I think it's, I think it's the experience factor for sure. Um, I've also, as I've gotten into animation, had the stark realization that there are just, uh, there's so many talented artists around me, as I alluded to, um, there are, and a lot of them are frankly just better at certain things than me. I mean, there's there's incredible painters, incredible animators, um, incredible colorists, like people who are really special in their own particular field. And so I think um, one thing over time, I was always drawn to it naturally. Uh, again, sort of being uh, having sort of the two sides of my brain from each of my parents influencing me at a young age. Um, I, over my career, have really tried to get involved in all facets of production. So that yeah. also includes talking to the producers about budgets and schedules, talking to the IT department about our technical process and how we can improve that kind of stuff. And so um, it's beyond just sort of like the frames themselves or the final output of the art. I mean, I really try to understand each and every aspect of the animation process and look for ways to make it more efficient, um, look for ways to make it more creatively rewarding, you know, and, and better looking at the end of the day. Um, so I think that's the thing is that as much as my passion is still, I still love painting and drawing and animating and getting in there, but um, kind of being able to say, hey, guys, this is how I would do this. Or, hey, maybe is there a more efficient way of doing that? Like, yeah, um, to enable other artists to do what they do and focus on their specialty is is just as important. Totally. You know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And uh, like at the end of the day, you're talking like animation is a business. So all the things you're saying contribute to that succeeding. I'm just wondering, like, you know, you have a very... Uh, I don't know how to say this, but like classic career where you started, you know, kind of at the bottom and you worked your way up and you're not like, I don't know what you consider top, but like you're pretty much at the top as a director at one of the biggest studios in the world. Um, so, you know, you mentioned a lot of things where you were constantly, uh, you know, learning other aspects of the job, thinking about it as a business, you know, uh, empowering people around you but what has enabled you to uh actively work your way to where you are now because you know there are people who are doing those things but they're and aspiring to get you know maybe from a storyboard revisionist to a storyboard uh to storyboard supervisor etc cetera, etc cetera. but they're they're staying in their position because you know they're good at what they do and they keep getting hired as that thing where they want to move on to you know director or supervisor what enabled you to keep 
uh, pushing and make make those steps up the ladder? Um, that's a great question, and, and I thank you for saying all that. I mean, I I also I don't necessarily view myself in that way. Like I I also try to just be very humble, and I I think it is humbling to hear you describe me in that way. Um, but I think part of it is just like making your intentions clear to those above you without being sort of um, not in an offensive way per se, but just like, Hey, I have aspirations to do this. And, and just talking to people uh, finding mentors is really important. I've had some incredible mm. mentors in my career, people I've worked with, um, you know, just being gracious and like humble and grateful I know this sounds kind of cliche, but like if you're a nice person who's genuinely enthusiastic about what you do, um, you're going to do OK, you know, like uh, and it's there's no problem with having greater aspirations and expressing that to people who are above you. I, I think good people in this industry would not feel threatened by that. They totally. they'd um, embrace that. There's a lot of incredible talented and kind people that um would be more than happy to nurture someone like that you know if it's done in a genuine and respectful way um and i don't know i mean i can't put my finger on one thing i just like i said i i'm a sort of um goal driven person so i try to set goals for myself every year and i communicate those to my supervisors and and even if I come short of that, it's something I still work towards. So yeah, um, I love where I'm at. You know, believe it or not, I still have greater aspirations of of a broader influence in our industry on a whole. And like whether you know that's specifically at Warner Brothers or just in general, like personally. Um, and it's just it's just continuing to work towards that stuff. Would you, you know. would you, I know at the beginning of kind of a new year here, would you be, feel, would you feel comfortable sharing one of the goals you have this year for yourself? <laughs> um, sure. I mean, you know, ultimately I see um, the way that we're, that we produce cartoons still in this day and age. There's some, there's some things that are a little antiquated still. And um for better or worse, I mean, there's a there's a huge reliance on overseas vendors, and yeah. that process in itself, I feel is totally valuable and valid. But there are some like antiquated st uh, steps in that process that that are sort of limiting. Um, so I think there's ways of doing it more efficiently and spending the same amount of money, but utilizing that that energy and resource towards like the actual production of the thing um so i have some ideas about that i mean i just you know i also still have aspirations to continue producing and directing things of my own or selling an idea which um no matter what people may say like it's really really hard to have an idea um of your own and, and a unique vision of something come to fruition so um, that may be an endless pursuit, but it's one that I, I'm happy to take on, you know, I try <laughs> I to, that. try to push myself to keep writing or coming up with ideas or envisioning how I might do something differently. Um, but, um, I, I'm certainly not trying to discourage young artists, but I mean, con I'm sure you deal with this too. Like you're constantly inundated with meeting people say, Oh, I have an idea for something, or they'll even go as far as developing it. And um, the odds of something that you've developed actually getting picked up and or produced or even greenlit for a development production is extremely rare. Um, but again, I think I, as I've gotten older, I've learned to appreciate. I don't see those things as dis discouraging because there's always something to be learned from that, even even the, by doing the process. Yeah. Um, you're going to be sharpening your skills and and learning something from that Ooh. you know or maybe you're pitching someone an idea and they they don't love that idea but they're taken by you and they and they say wow that person that's not for us but that person was intriguing and they had some interesting ideas and like i'm gonna follow them away for 
something else that comes along. So you never know. But hundred um, percent. I mean, I'm I'm one of those people that will pitch forever. <laughs> um, and you know, I haven't gotten something. I have gotten something signed for with a producer, but I haven't gotten anything greenlit or anything. But there's been tons of other opportunities that have come. I've had studios ask me to develop uh, characters for a new show that they've had just because they've exposed. I've been they've been exposed to my art simply from yeah. me pitching them and they were looking for something unique. I'm running a pitching workshop next month. I awesome. have all this other connections and whatever just from putting myself out there and getting better at storytelling and uh, you know being concise with what you say and all that stuff. So yeah, 100%. I like your attitude of uh, you know always taking something regardless of the experience, like you said before, where it's gut-wrenching to have a show not be <laughs> greenlit, but you learned a bunch of stuff and made connections and a new skill and whatever. So, yeah, yeah, I think, you know, as it's, it's, it may be kind of weird to look at your career in a span of maybe an hour, but, and from somebody else's perspective too, where I'm like, you know, I basically look at your IMDB and your LinkedIn and I'm like, all right, he went from this, 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 and it seems like a very clear cut path, but when you're in it, you know, you have no idea what the future, where the future is going, what is going to come from this project, et cetera, et cetera. So sure. I like what you said about, Sorry, to, but to interject there, at the same time, like on a personal level, my life has been changing and evolving too, right? I was I was a single guy living in Hollywood for a decade. Like that's yeah. a totally different perspective on and and <laughs> on career, life, et cetera, versus settling down, having a family. And then, um, you know, a lot of time there was a fear almost of like the big studio. Oh, that's going to stifle my creativity and stuff not at all you know it's just a different avenue to enable this and as stability and different things become more important um that attitude and navigation shifts as well so um i think i think smaller studios are incredible places for younger artists to get their feet wet and to wear multiple hats and take on responsibility that they maybe wouldn't in a larger space. Um, but at the same time, there's incredible benefits from working at large, large studio, you know, experiences as well. So yeah. Well, why not Most, both? <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Your yeah, show gets canceled, move to the next to the next place. <laughs> there you go. Well, there's certainly that's that's definitely a seems to be a common um thread amongst some younger artists are, are kind of like the job hopping and stuff. But yeah, yeah. I mean, at the same time. It, you got to you got to snatch the opportunities when you can sometimes totally you know? i mean you kind of hit on something for me i have a i have a a fear of working for a big studio because i want to be super creative in what i do but why not who cares work there yeah. for a couple of years then move on or something like that so, right yeah yeah um well you know we've chatted about a whole bunch of stuff here where you came <laughs> from how you got there uh you know the recent guardians of the galaxy holiday special you got to work on which I think is amazing and you did it hand drawn each frame in rotoscope which sounds insane to me but it's uh you know it worked out perfectly is there anything kind of that you wanted that we didn't talk about or you wanted to share for those listening that you think would be interesting to hear I, we I don't know we covered quite a bit you covered um, the whole thing <laughs> yeah not necessarily um I think as we discuss, I mean I encourage young artists who have questions or people out there to reach out to me. I'll do my best to respond in a timely manner. Um, but yeah, I'm just, I feel very blessed to get to do what I do for a living. Um, I I can't imagine doing anything else, you know, and I, yeah. I don't, it's, I'm well past the point of doing any, of learning another skill or something outside of this industry at this point. And I just, I just feel blessed, like getting to tell stories and, and make cartoons about superheroes or whatever else it may be is definitely a dream come true. So, well, that is that is amazing to hear. And especially because at the beginning, you said nobody it's a ton of hard work. Nobody just nobody just happens to become an animator by accident. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. Yeah. Well, thank you, Max, so much for coming on the chat. It's been an absolute pleasure. And, uh, you know, it's been great to pick your brain and learn all about how you make things happen. So thank you so much. No, my pleasure. A pleasure chatting with you as well.
Great. And uh, if you're listening and you want to reach out or check out his work or whatever, you can do so by looking at his website, which is macwhiting.net. And I'll also include his Instagram, LinkedIn, and IMDb in the description of this chat. And that's all for now. So thank you so much for listening. Okay, bye. The music for this podcast was composed by Will Farmer and the graphics by Daniel Abensauer. I encourage you to look them up if you enjoyed their work.